All right, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, have to apologize for the power outage. It's a little bit beyond our control, but uh, fortunately, God is good, and it's back up and running. Didn't stay out very long, but we've got everything booted back up, and we're good to go again. And as we were saying, uh, we uh, we have studied on, on, on last week, uh, introduced the, the chapter 15, the resurrection, and the Apostle Paul talking about the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He, he takes on, we got all the way down through verse 11. And so he takes on from verse 12 all the way to the end of the chapter, discussing specifically about the resurrection. Because, see, the whole, whole focus or the whole basis of the gospel is based on the resurrection. There's been a lot of people who have lived on earth. There are a lot of people who have died on earth. And there's a lot of people who, once they were dead, were buried. So the death, the, re, uh, the death burial of Jesus Christ it is no big deal. It only becomes a big deal once we add that third component, that is the resurrection. And so, unfortunately, in the, in the church at Corinth, there were factions that did not believe that there was actually such a thing as a resurrection. They had become Christians. They had converted over from Judaism. They were part of, uh, you know, the, they had left the idolatric, uh, idolatry and so forth, their worship behind. They had had come out of the, uh, the Gentile, you know, sinful lifestyle. Uh, and, and, and yet, in the church, they were still holding some of their old beliefs as to whether or not there was a resurrection. And some of them didn't believe. And we know that to be a fact in the church today. You can bring someone in from uh, a world religion. You can bring someone in from a false doctrine church. And, and you can baptize them into the church of Christ. You can get them introduced to the Bible and really understanding and being taught the Bible. And yet they will still bring with them some of their old understandings and belief until, you know, of course, until they learn otherwise. And, and so here in the church, people were still believing that, that they, they believed in Jesus Christ, they, they had obeyed the gospel, and yet they still held the belief that there's really no such thing as a real, actual resurrection of the dead. And so Paul goes into this, and he begins to, to break it down to them in a series of, of, of thought processes as to why it is essential, absolutely essential to a faith in Jesus Christ, a belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we believe that there is such a thing as a literal resurrection from the dead. There are many who have said that, oh, you know, Jesus really didn't, didn't raise from the dead. He really wasn't actually dead. And there's a philosophy called the swoon theory that he was under so much pressure, he was under, you know, that he just kind of passed out. They looked at him, they thought he was dead, they put him in the grave, and then in the coolness of the tomb, his body had a chance to regenerate, and, 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 and he came back to consciousness and got, got out of there. Uh, and, uh, you know, and of course, there's a few other philosophies that, that have come out of that. Uh, but the fact of it is that we believe, the Bible teaches, and the gospel is evident of that Jesus Christ actually did die. He was literally buried, and that he literally rose from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. Now, Paul proceeds in verse 12, and uh, this section will carry on to the end of the chapter, verse 58. But we'll take a chunk of that right now, and we'll go down to verse 19 and take a look at what Paul has to say as he argues the reality of the resurrection of the dead. <clears throat> now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there be no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ be not risen, then is our preaching vain, and your faith is also vain. Yea, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified that God, of God, that he raised up Christ, whom he raised not up, if so be, that the dead rise not. Fourth, if the dead rise not, then Christ is not raised. 
And if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain. You are yet in your sins. Then they also which are fallen asleep in Christ are perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. Now notice what Paul is, is, is saying here in these few verses here uh, about the, just the logical conclusion. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket science to draw these, these conclusions. And that is, if we are saying that the gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we obey the gospel, we obey that form of doctrine which was delivered to us, and then we believe that through the power of his resurrection from the dead, we have been cleansed of our sins, we are now standing before God whole and sinless under the blood of Jesus Christ, and yet we go back and say, well, well I don't really believe there's such thing as a resurrection of the dead. I'll say, how, how is that possible? How is it that you don't believe that? Because uh, if, if that's true, then everything that we've been preaching to you is a lie. Everything. Because if the dead rise not, then Christ isn't raised. We have been going around testifying that we know of a fact that God raised Christ from the dead and obviously didn't if we're going to conclude that there's no such thing as a resurrection of the dead at all. Our faith is vain. What are we believing in after all? Are we believing in a dead Jesus? We can't believe that Jesus raised from the dead if there's no such thing as resurrection. And so Paul is saying, you know, we have no faith. There's no salvation. We're yet in our sins. Jesus is no different than anybody else who's died and been buried if he's still yet in his grave. Uh, there's been a lot of great prophets and leaders across the world that have rose to power, that have come to prominence, and have touched the lives of people and died and, and were buried. And that would make Jesus just like one of them. And then he goes on to, to point out something that I think Paul, after he, and this is something that Paul does quite frequently in his, in his, in his writings, he will approach a subject from a logical standpoint. And then he will approach it from an emotional standpoint. He's just got through arguing all the points. If, if Jesus had, if, if, if the dead of the resurrection, Jesus is not risen, therefore, there's no salvation, there's no sense, of, there's no basis for our faith, We've been lying to you the whole time. You're still, you're still sinners. And then he says, verse 16, or verse 18, actually. Then they which have fallen asleep in Jesus are perished. One of the comforting things that we have of our loved ones is that they died in, in Christ. And that because of that, they are eternally secure. I don't know that, that's a comforting fact. I don't know sometimes our heart is broken when our loved one passes on and we're pretty confident that they weren't in Jesus. That, that's heartbreaking. But then to say, hey, I know mom, I know mom died in Christ. I feel confident of, you know, I know dad died in Christ. My brother, my sister, my aunt, my uncle, whoever it was, they died in Christ and thank God that they're in a better place. So Paul says, well, what about them? There's no salvation. There's no deliverance from sin. And therefore, you're saying that all of your loved ones that have gone on before are gone, perished, non-existent. And that's when he, he points out in verse 19 that, that there is more to salvation than th just this life. Now, now, that's not to say that there aren't some great things that happen to us as Christians in this life. Now, we, we, we walk under the protection of an almighty God. We, we walk under the blessings of God. And he, he watches out for us. He, he leads us in the paths of righteousness. He, he restores our soul. He, he, he takes care of us. Even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we don't have to be afraid. But Paul would say, yeah, yeah, that's, that's all good. It's all good. But if in this life only we have hope in Christ, that's awful. We are among all men most miserable. Our salvation does not end at our death. Death is not a blind alley that leads mankind into a state of nothingness. But it's an open door that leads to life eternal. It's not a 
period that ends the sentence of life, it's a tremendous point that punctuates it. Gives us some excitement to look forward to. We are going to be dead a lot longer than we're going to be alive in this world. And it only makes sense if that's what's going to be the bulk of our existence that we prepare for that time that we're going to be living for so long. Death is just a separation. It is not an end. And so Paul is saying that if there's no resurrection, if you literally do not have the option of being able to live after you die, then this is a horrible deal. Life is a horrible deal. What kind of sick joke is it for us to have to live and suffer through this world and then that's it? And that's, that's what has been taught by many people. Uh, a lot of times in, in our lives, when, when we will many, when, when we may listen and hear something somebody says and buy into it, we say, you know, that sounds pretty good. And never stop to think about the ramifications when we draw that conclusion to its obvious end. And this is what Paul, I think, is dealing with these Christians here in Corinth, is that you really hadn't thought this thing through. Because if there is no resurrection of the dead, then everything that we're doing here means nothing. None of it means anything. And we are one day going to pass on and be gone, and, and we won't have any other hope for anything else. Paul then goes into the next section of his discussion. And if you're following with us in your, in, in your book, on page 77, Paul, he is the, the, the writer of our textbook, has laid that all out on the page there. And, and bold points and the, the things that we've just touched on. But Paul carries on picking up at, at verse 20 and going through verse 23. And, and, and then he begins to make a defense of, of Jesus' resurrection. Now that he has pointed out the, the obvious conclusion, if we don't believe in a resurrection, that all of this is not, to make sure he, we, we don't fall for the fact that Paul is actually saying that Jesus didn't raise from the dead. He begins to defend the idea of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, <clears throat> when he starts at verse 20 to 23, but now is Christ risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. For since man came death, since by man came death, and by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, and afterward they that are Christ at his coming. So here we're introduced to the, to the term first fruits in verse 20, and then it's re reiterated in verse 23. And that is that now Christ is risen from the dead and become the first fruits of them that slept. And you have to ask the question, what does it really mean that he was the first fruit? And, you know, first fruits mean that, that this, this is the, the, the fruit that comes off of the tree or the bush. It's the first one. Okay? The, the, the tree has been planted. It's gone through a year or two of preparation. It's grown its, its branches, its foliage. And now, for the first time, maybe a year or two later, it's actually going to bear fruit. And so you see it, that apple, that pear, that peach, whatever it is, this is the first one that comes off the tree, the first fruits. If you refer, refer back to the Old Testament, the children of Israel, every time they got ready to harvest their crop, they had to offer to God the first fruits. That means the very first that came out of that crop that field that year. So what does it mean that Jesus is the first fruit? Because it is very obvious that Jesus was not the first one that ever rose from the dead. I mean, the, the Old Testament is full of it, of, of the history of that. In fact, during Jesus' ministry, I think he raised one or two himself, didn't he? Lazarus was one of them, wasn't it? So we know Jesus was not the first person to have raised from the dead. If you go back on into the Old Testament and, and you, you, you look, watch the prophet, you know, he raised, raised the... The, uh, the, the widow's son. Uh, and, you know. But Jesus was the first one to raise from the dead to die no more. See, all the rest of Lazarus, I'm doing, you know, I don't know how much longer he lived after Jesus raised him from the dead. Don't know. 
But we do know that he had to be death again. All of those just those times in the Old Testament, we only have a, a couple of events where you know Enoch was taken by God. And, and, and Elijah was swept up in a, in a fiery chariot. But other than that, people have died. Even those raised from the dead. And at the time of Jesus' uh, uh, death, the Bible says that the, the, the sepulchers were open. And many of the saints walked into Jerusalem. Now, that, that was all fine and good. But yet, they would have still had to die again. The Bible teaches us and, and, and that Jesus, once he rose from the dead, he defeated death. And that means that he, he was never going to be conquered by it again. And the verse 23 then extends that same thing to us. And, and that is that Jesus being the first fruit, we who belong to Christ will become that which follows after him. We will become then those who can rise from the dead to die no more. Every man in his order. Verse 21 and 22, Paul is dealing with the idea that in Adam we, we were introduced to death. His sin of, in the Garden of Eden brought death to the human race. And by that same thing, Jesus Christ, the man, then brought life back to the human race. As in Adam, verse 22 says, all die. But even so in Christ shall all be made alive. <clears throat> Picking up from there and going on forward into 24 through 28, Paul then begins to, to talk about the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, the, the greatness of him and, uh, and how that he has to fulfill his, his responsibility as, as the Lord and King and Savior uh, and talks about his reigning uh, and then conquering death. Verses 24 to 28, he says, Then cometh the end. Now notice he said in verse 23, But every man in his order, Christ the first fruits, and afterward they that are Christ that is coming, then comes the end. When he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he hath put down all rule and all authority and power, for he must reign till he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. For he hath put all things under his feet. But when he says all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accepted which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Now, if you're not careful, the him and the he and the, the it, gets, it almost gets so twisted up you can't tell which one's what. Uh, and, and it has to be, you know, you have to read with, with some good understanding, and probably read it several times to really get the grasp of what exactly he's saying here. Jesus Christ has the responsibility to bring man to God. And through his death, his burial, his resurrection, he did that. And ultimately, he will then extend that to the human race. Uh, and in so doing, the Bible says that he, when the end comes, that he extends that to the human race in verse 24. He will have at that point delivered the kingdom or brought the kingdom to God. Because at that time, he will have put down. Now, you have to understand what he means by the word put, the word put down. That doesn't mean he will have laid down, but that he will have suppressed. He will have overthrown. He will have pre destroyed, put down. That's like you would put down an insurrection. You go out there with a powerful military force and just crush whoever is, uh, whoever is trying to fight against you. He will have put down all rule and all authority and all power. And so here he is. He's come, as the end comes, he delivers the kingdom of God to God, the Father. And that's, he'll do that when he has put down all other opposition. 
Verse 25 says, For he must reign until he hath put all enemies under his feet. And the last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And I think that's a very important po point there. The last enemy that Jesus Christ will destroy will be death. And Paul's going to circle back around to that point in the last few verses of the chapter and talk about that. But I want you to keep that in mind as we look at that. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. And once he has destroyed death, then we won't ever have to worry about dying anymore. In fact, Hebrews writes about how the very purpose for Jesus coming to this earth was to deliver them who, because they were so afraid of dying, they lived their entire lives in bondage. That's Hebrews chapter 2. His very purpose was to deliver man from the fear of death. And so here he's saying that the last enemy that he'll have to put down will be death. Verse 27 says, For he, out, he hath put all things under his feet. And, and notice here, the statement is, he has put all things under his feet. Now who is the he? Well, and this is where it kind of gets convoluted if you're not tracking the, the personal pronouns. We know that always, whenever we use a pronoun, it refers back to a antecedent. That is a noun somewhere that is in making reference to. You know, if I'm writing a letter, and I'm writing a letter to, to John, and I don't have to say, well, John did this, and then John did that, and then John did this. You know, I can start inserting in there, well, and then he, and, and then he, or then she, if it's a, it's a lady I'm talking about. And so... Here we got the, the idea is that for he hath put all things under his feet. Now, one person could read that and they say, well, Jesus just put everything under his own feet. But that's not exactly what it's saying because the first he is making reference to the reference of the Father. The Father has put everything under, not the Father's feet. But Jesus' feet, there's two different antecedents being flo uh, floated along in here. And if we back up from verse 27, we'll notice in verse 25, he must reign until he, again, until he has put all enemies under his feet. Again, first he here is referring to Jesus. Second he here is referring to the Father. If you back up just another verse, then comes the end when he, shall have delivered, that's verse 20, 24, the kingdom unto God, even the Father, when he, that is the God, God shall have put down all rule and power and authority. So again, if, you, if you're not keeping track of what he's saying, it gets kind of convoluted. You can't tell the difference between who's Jesus and who's, who's the Father. It's real easy to, 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 to make that uh, uh, make, make an incorrect conclusion on that. But, but the point is, is that <clears throat> he gets down and it's really important to, to understand the difference when we get down to verse 20, 27. For, he's, for he hath put all things under his feet. And then he clarifies something. He said, now, but what I'm saying, he put all things under him. It's obvious that the one putting all things under him isn't under him too. In other words, God, the Father is, is subduing everything for the Son. And so he put everything under his feet. But it, sometimes when we say everything or all, we don't really mean everything or all. And, and the con context has to, has to help us out with that identification. So Paul, in order to keep the current in church and us as well, from misunderstanding that, simply says, now, now, now understand me, when God puts everything under Jesus' feet, that don't include him. He says it's evident, it's manifest, that he is accepted. The all includes everything except the Father. He is accepted or he is excluded, which did put all things under him. So, it's, like I say, it, it gets a little cerebral there just a little bit, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and if you're not careful, it, there's a lot of times in the scriptures in which when it's talking about God and, and, and Jesus, it, it, it 
you have to make it, make sure you read very carefully because there are a lot of people who have drawn erroneous conclusions from things. Uh, and sometimes they'll even conclude falsely that, well, you know, it's, they're really the same person anyway, so you know, it doesn't matter. So the idea is that, that the end will come. God will have totally subdued everything under the authority of Jesus Christ. And when that happens, death will be the final enemy to be destroyed. And he will reign until then. Verse 28 said, And when all things are subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. Everything in its place Every play thing in its order is a, a message that the Apostle Paul has preached all throughout this writing. Uh, the, the role, our role in the church, our place in the body of Christ, our place in the, under the, the leadership of God, whether we're a man or a woman, all, all of that always it, it, it is, is evident in the scriptures that even though we are all equal in the eyes of God, we still have our role, we still have our place, we have to perform in. And even in the, in the case of the Godhead, even though they're all equal, they still hold their own position. And God is all in all. The Son, Jesus, is, is subject unto him. But they don't have a problem with that like we have a problem with that, do they? God had to fight over who's got, the, who's got the authority, who's got the control, and who's in charge. So Jesus, when he was he started talking about dying, that was the very first thing his apostles started talking about, wasn't it? Well, if Jesus is going to be gone, I guess I'll take over. <laughs> Jesus said, you know, Gentiles, sinners, folks, they, they argue about that silly stuff. Y'all don't argue about that stuff. You want to be the leader, you get out there and work the hardest. <clears throat> it's in our, our next section. We'll kind of touch on this here as we're drawing to a close here. We're getting closer. I know we didn't get to cover as much because of the uh, uh, the, the technological shortage we had there, power outage. But uh, <clears throat> we'll we'll pick up on that when we we get back in uh, on, on Sunday morning. Maybe we'll have better be, better uh, power supply then. We got a moment or two, we'll share just another thought or two with you. And that carries us on into verse 28, 29, rather, 34. Uh, Paul begins to to draw to draw out the, the, the consequence or the the conclusion and the danger of drawing false conclusions. You know, there are a lot of times that we in our studies, if we're committed to studying God's word, we can come to some conclusions that that may not be actually right. And, you know, I think God understands that. As long as our heart is in the right place and we're really trying to do the right thing, he'll help us sort through the problem. But in the process, we're still being warned about drawing false conclusions by, by looking at the word, the word of God. It's amazing. One Bible over the ages has created thousands and thousands of different churches all teaching different doctrines all with different beliefs all focused on different things it's always because a lot of people got in there and read something and then drew false conclusions and Paul is warning against that in verse 29 through 34 and we'll start in on this here and then we'll pick it up uh, again on, on Sunday morning else what shall they do that are baptized for the dead if the dead rise not at all. Why are they baptized for the dead? And why stand we in jeopardy every hour? I protest by your rejoicing, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord. I die daily. If after the manner of men, I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage in me if the dead rise not? Let's eat and drink. For tomorrow, we die. Be not deceived. 
Evil communications corrupt good manners. Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak to your shame. But some men will say, how are the dead raised up? And with what body do they come? Thou fool. That which thou soweth is not quickened except it die. And that which thou soweth, thou soweth not the body that it shall be, but bear grain, if by chance of wheat, or some other grain. But God giveth it the body that please him, and to every seed his own body. All flesh is not the same flesh. But there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, and another of fishes, and another of birds. Now, notice what Paul starts out here in verse 29. And, and this is something that, that people have taken and run with. When he says, else what do they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise not at all, why are they baptized for the dead? It almost sounds like Paul is saying that it is a practice in the church to be baptized for dead folks. And so, Catholic Church early on brought on an idea that people, when they die, they don't actually go into judgment. They, 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 they go to a place of purgatory. If they're not in a good state with God, they, they then can go into a holding cell at which then the living relatives can kind of bargain for their release. Be baptized for them, perhaps. Of course, not a whole lot of money in that, so the Catholic Church worked out a deal where they could generate some cash behind it. And so then you could actually pay to get someone out of purgatory. Uh, the Bible is very clear in the book of Acts about how a person gets saved. And that is when they hear the word of God, when they believe it, when they repent of their sins, when they confess the name of Jesus Christ, and when they are baptized. Nowhere is it ever taught that I can hear for you, that I can believe it for you, that I can actually confess your sins, although there are a lot of times when brothers and sisters in the church will confess each other's sins. My responsibility is only to confess mine, not yours. And then I can, can, can only accept Jesus and confess his name as my Savior. I can't do it for you. And I certainly can't be baptized for you. Paul is not proclaiming doctrine of being able to be baptized for the dead. The issue is that in the church or in the culture in which they were living, that was a practice by false doctrine. A false doctrine practice. The question that Paul was arguing, if you believe that, what are you doing that for? What's the point? If you're going out of your way to go and get baptized for a dead person that ain't never going to be raised from the dead anyway, why would you do that? What's the point? And it's obvious that if you don't think that you're affecting their eternal salvation, then you wouldn't do it because there'd be no point in it. No more than you would get baptized for your dog or cat. So Paul's not embracing a doctrine here. He is simply saying that there are some beliefs that you have which don't make sense if you don't really believe that there is a resurrection of the dead. And then, as my last point here, and that's in verse 30, he raised the question. Why are we risking our lives for the cause of Christ? Well, what kind of sense does that make? If there's no salvation, if there's no resurrection, if there is no ultimate gain that we can get, why would we die for a cause? The fact of it is you wouldn't if you don't gain anything. And we think about people who have died for the benefit of others. We talk about our founding fathers of this, this nation, how that they 
went into a civil war, financed it with money of their own because they believed in being able to pass on the freedoms or the blessings of liberty to their posterity. That's something they gained from it. We gain eternal life when we die in the Lord. And therefore, Paul didn't mind standing in jeopardy every hour. But, but the fact of it is, is if there is no resurrection of the dead, and if there is no salvation, if there's no eternity that we can gain hold of, then why would we jeopardize our lives for something that does not exist? And it's an obvious rhetorical question because the answer is no, we wouldn't. Why, we wouldn't do that. There'd be no point. We'll pick up on verse 31. And we'll touch on verse 30 and go into 31 on Sunday morning. We thank you so much for your, your time and attention this, this morning or this evening. Uh, and we trust that, uh, that you will stay with us as we finish up this, this book and continue our study. God bless you. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus and what can make me whole again. Nothing but the blood of Jesus singing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as stone. No other fountain I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus.